Hello everybody, you have tuned in to Eric Jose on Making a Murderer on YouTube. I cover virtually any aspect of Making a Murderer. I go over the evidence, the documents, the photos. So if you'd like, stay tuned and in the future I'll have many more videos besides the one you're about to see. Hello, big shout out to everybody out there at the MEM rallies this weekend. <laughs> big shout out to everybody out there showing their support. Okay, as you know, this is part two. We just came off of part one where we were t we were hearing Mr. Gershman explain how the two press conferences held on March 1st and March 2nd, where he used Brendan's confession to, he, he basically used the details of that confession, and he basically put that out in the public, on the news media, to a nationwide audience, and, and that sort of thing, and that, that that was prosecutorial misconduct. And the fact that he, um, that he had changed uh, upon Brendan making the confession on March 1st and 2nd, Ken Kratz changed his original narrative that he originally, uh, pressed that he originally used to press charges against Steven. He, he, he basically changed it and added charges at that point. So now we're going to move into the documents where he talks about basically what all is wrong with this. He kind of goes into more depth about what exactly all is wrong with this. It includes the fact that Ken Crouch should never, ever, ever have even brought charges of like mutilating a corpse and uh, and, and uh, imprisonment and rape and all that. He's that all never should have been brought against Stephen because Brendan's confession would never have ever been able to be used against Stephen. And the reason why is because it is uncorroborated. It is pretty much completely uncorroborated. There's really nothing to back up Brendan's story. So it's basically all hearsay. And so therefore it would never have been able to be admissible in Stephen's trial. And Kring Kratz would know this as an experienced prosecutor at the time for 20 years. Okay. So, we're going to move into the document now where he goes into a bit more depth about what exactly all is wrong with what he did at the two press conferences that he held on March 1st and 2nd. Charging Avery based on Dassey's confession, Kratz knew at the time of his March 2nd press conference that every statement he made accusing Avery of the horrific acts against Theresa Halbach, shackling, raping, torturing, and butchering her to death, was based exclusively on an uncorroborated confession of 16-year-old Brendan Dassey, which was rec which has recently been found by a federal court to have been coerced by police. Kratz knew that Dassey w was of borderline intelligence, attended special education classes, and was known as a mild-mannered, introverted young man who was never before in trouble with the law. <clears throat> as the head of the investigation, Kratz knew several other critical facts the police interrogated Dassey several times without his lawyer or parent being present. There were no independent facts of circumstances to corroborate Dassey's confession. Dassey's confession presented a narrative that was totally different from the version Kratz used in filing his original charges against Stephen Avery. And Dassey's confession was legally inadmissible against Avery for constitutional and statutory reasons. In short, Kratz had no evidence and therefore no legal basis to support the new charges of sexual assault and torture against Avery continued into the amended complaint and announced at the press conference. In addition to saturating the media and the public with an extraordinarily horrific description of Avery repeatedly raping and torturing and sadistically butchering to death a young woman, Kratz knew when he brought the new charges against Avery that he had no legal basis to do so. Kratz knew what a four-month police investigation had conducted that had conducted at least eight separate searches of Avery's trailer, garage, and other parts of the property had yielded no forensic physical or physical evidence in cr to corroborate Dassey's confession. A prosecutor engages in pr pr professional misconduct when he makes unwarranted claims and brings unwarranted criminal charges. See Wisconsin rules of professional miscon or professional conduct. Moreover, in bringing charges that are not legally and factually sustainable, Kratz engaged in professional misconduct for another reason. Prosecutors are commanded not to prosecute a charge that the prosecutor knows is not, suppo is not supported by probable cause. Wisconsin Rules of Professional Conduct. D. Draper versus the United States. 
Kratz knew that he lacked sufficient evidence to charge Avery with the acts described in Dassey's confession. Dassey's confession, as Kratz surely knew, was inadmissible against Avery under the Sixth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. See Bruton versus the United States. Dassey's confession was also inadmissible against Avery because it violated a fundamental rule of evidence barring use of statements that are hearsay. See Wisconsin Evidence Rule. Kratz's conduct constituted professional misconduct. Kratz was an experienced prosecutor. He knew that Dassey's confession was inadmissible against Avery and that there and that there would be was no evidence to corroborate Dassey's account of Hallbach's murder. He lacked probable cause, indeed, any factual basis what's, whatever to file his amended complaint charging Avery with the additional crimes of sexual assault and torture and then publicly announced those new charges to the world. In my opinion, Kratz brought these new charges against Avery in bad faith. He knew he would not be able to present these facts against Avery to a jury. As demonstrated by his decision to drop the sexual assault and kidnapping charges on February 2, 2007, he disclosed these facts publicly knowing that they would be heard by prospective jurors and used to prejudice Avery. Moreover, Kratz is charging Avery without a proper evidentiary basis constituted professional misconduct under a separate ethics rule. As noted, prosecutors cannot file criminal charges without a sufficient legal basis to support those charges. See Wisconsin Rules of Professional Conduct. By charging without a proper factual basis and then re representing inofficial court documents and in his public statement that those charges were validly brought, Kratz engaged in fraudulent, dishonest, deceitful, and a misleading conduct. Kratz also engaged in professional misconduct yet for yet another reason. Kratz's official and public statements went so far beyond that any reason of, uh, even any responsible prosecutor would believe were appropriate judicial and public statements that he thereby violated the attorney's oath by advancing facts prejudicial to the reputation of a party without any legitimate reason in law or justice to do so. See the Wisconsin Rules of Pro Professional Conduct. It is one thing for a co-defendant like Dassey to make allegations that implicate, implicate himself and others. It is a far different thing for a prosecutor not only to repeat those statements publicly, but also to endorse them as truth particularly when there is no factual basis to confirm their validity. All of Kratz's references to Avery's alleged heinous acts were gratuitous, without any legitimate basis in fact or law, without any legitimate law enforcement reason, and destroyed Avery's character, his ability to receive a fair trial, and his constitutional right to the presumption of innocence. Collectively, Kratz's statements were offensive to the fair and proper administration of justice and the integrity of our system of justice the demonstrate and demonstrated Kratz's unfitness as a prosecutor see the ABA model rule um, Robert Milan what do you think Mr. Marley uh, from the prosecutor's perspective does the lack of corroboration in Brendan's confession in the form of evidence or otherwise give you pause or concern? Yeah, from a prosecutor's perspective, you know, Dr. Kavanaugh and, and, and Laura and others can talk about, you know, the, the child's psychological issues and, and the demeanor, as Laura pointed out, and those things that, that others look at. But, but from a prosecutor, the way I looked at a case was corroboration. And to me, and I've taught this over and over again, but a confession is absolutely worthless unless you can corroborate it. I'll say it again. A confession is absolutely worthless unless it can be corroborated. And if you look at the Brendan Dassey case, there is zero corroboration to back up that very, very weak confession he gave. The evidence that would have been left at that scene could not have been cleaned up by the the sharpest individual, let alone Avery and Dassey. There is no way they could have cleaned up all that blood. There is no way that there wouldn't have been marks left from shackles on the bed and, and everything else. There's no way that, that that young woman's hair wouldn't have been found in that trailer. 
or semen on the sheets or the bedding. Not a chance that, that those things wouldn't have been found. And the fact that there is zero physical evidence to corroborate a very, very weak and ridiculous uh, confession taken by that young man should be enough for the Wisconsin prosecutors and the Wisconsin police to walk away from that case. Okay, so that was Robert Milan we just heard from, a former prosecutor, retired prosecutor. Uh, he did some work with, he actually was a prosecutor with the federal government for a little while. He's very respected. Um, he is also, he's featured in the uh, Brendan Dassey video on YouTube called Brendan Dassey, the, A True Story of a False Confession. I will post the link for it down in the info below this video here. I will also post the link to part one down below in the info there. If you somehow came into this part two before seeing part one. Anyway, so that was Robert Milan. And I really like that guy. He, uh, he sums it up well. So now we're going to move into the next bit. In the last letter to Avery, dated September 6, 2015, Kratz refers to Avery's letter dated August 28, 2015, in which Avery asked Kratz whether he checked out the fingerprints found on Teresa Hallbach's car. Kratz apologizes for misunderstanding Avery's June 2013 letter. Kratz states that I thought you were interested in being honest about what happened and finally telling the whole story to someone. Kratz adds, since I'm the person who probably knows more about your case than anyone else, I hoped you would choose me to tell your story to. Kratz continues, Unfortunately, you only want to continue your nonsense about being set up. That's too bad, because you had one opportunity to finally tell all the details, but now that will never happen. By the way, the difference between you and the famous convicted murderers are from the, pa from the past is that they told their whole truthful story to someone who then wrote a book about what actually happened and people got to understand both sides. I was willing to do that for you, but if you are going to continue to lie about what happened between you and Miss Halbach, I am not interested. If you change your mind, I want, I want you to tell your honest story someday. Please contact me. Kratz's conduct in approaching the man he vilified brought unsubstantiated charges against convicted of murder and sent to prison for life he, wanting him wanting him to tell his true story is unlike any conduct of any ex-prosecutor i have ever encountered kratz's conduct is offensive to the proper administration of justice his intimidation and manipulation of his own selfish motive of the person he is he prosecuted impairs the dignity of the legal profession and of the ethical responsibility of lawyers to abstain from overreaching, harassing, and manipulating manipulative conduct. Basically, trying to disprove the, the Shakespeare quote, first thing we do is kill all the lawyers, right? <laughs> Moreover, there is an uncanny parallel between Kratz's solicitation of Avery as a private lawyer and Kratz's solicitation of vulnerable women when he was a prosecutor. In 2010, Kratz was investigated by the Wisconsin Division of Criminal Investigation for sending inappropriate texts and email messages to women, including victims, in active domestic abuse cases Kratz was then prosecuting. There was at least 10 women who complained about Kratz's improper sexual overtones, overtures to them. Sorry, The state investigation led the Wisconsin District Attorney's Association to call for Kratz's resignation, for Governor James Doyle to initiate removal proceedings against Kratz, and after Kratz involuntarily resigned for the Office of for the Office of Lawyer Regulation in 2011 to bring a disciplinary complaint against Kratz Alleging several, count, several counts of professional misconduct, Kratz was found to have committed professional misconduct by violating the attorney's oath, which includes abstaining from offensive personality, Wisconsin Rules of Professional Conduct. He was suspended for four months from the practice of law. The Wisconsin Supreme Court upheld the suspension, seeing the matter of disciplinary proceedings against Kenneth R. Kratz. Among the allegations supporting that sanction were the following. Kratz contacted a young woman who had accused her boyfriend of domestic violence, asking her whether she is the kind of girl that likes secret contact with an older elected DA, the riskier the better. 
Kratz sent the same woman eight more inappropriate messages, including, You may be the tall, hot, young nymph, but I am the prize. I would want you to be so hot and treat me so well that you'd be the woman. Are you that good? Kratz is prosecuting a parental rights termination case, told a woman who was a witness that he won't come in your mouth, and later he was leaving on a trip to Las Vegas where he could have big-boobed women serve me drinks. And Kratz commented in court to a social worker that the court reporter had big, beautiful breasts. Kratz tried to defend his appalling behavior towards women by raising incredible, inconsistent, hypertechnical, and puzzling arguments. His claim that he wanted to amicably resolve the disciplinary proceedings according to the Wisconsin Supreme Court borders on the intellectually insulting. Kratz's insistence that his conduct resulted from addiction to drugs does not change the ugly picture presented by the record. Increasingly, quite similar allegations in the disciplinary proceeding against Kratz are, pre are present in Kratz's solicitation of Avery. Thus, in the disciplinary proceeding, Kratz was found to have acted with a selfish motive, manipulated a vulnerable victim, engaged in exploitive behavior, engaged in harassing behavior, showed a crass placement of his personal interests above those of his client, and crossed the line separating the unprofessional conduct from the acutely offensive and harassing. The referee also noted as an aggravating factor Ken Kratz's considerable legal experience and leadership on victims' rights. To be sure, Avery was neither a client of Kratz nor a crime victim, and so his conduct towards Avery may not have been as boorish or appalling the way the Wisconsin Supreme Court characterized Kratz's conduct towards the vulnerable victims of his sexual pursuits. But as a matter of professional ethics, Kratz's conduct towards Avery was, an, was as intimidating, self-interested, and manipulative as it was to the women Kratz abused. Avery was in a hopeless position and an easy target for Kratz's solicitations. Kratz knew the prison authorities had objected to Avery speaking to Kratz and that Kratz's overtures might hurt Avery. Particularly disingenuous was Kratz's ploy to suggest falsely that Kratz was simply a disinterested person trying to assist Avery to tell his honest story to the world, but knowing full well he, he, that he wanted Avery's story only if Avery told his story in a way that served Kratz's selfish interests in writing a book and promoting himself. Kratz exploited his former status as Avery's prosecutor, who knows more about your case than anyone. Kratz disparaged Avery's continued nonsense about being set up. He intimidated Avery as he did the, with the women he abused, trying to convince Avery to talk to him by the veiled threat that it was too bad that Avery refused to talk to him because you had one opportunity to finally tell the detail, tell all the details, but now you will ne that will never happen. That same ugly picture depicted in Kratz's offensive sexual misconduct with women appears in Kratz's solicitation of Avery. Kratz acted out of his own self-interest in an utterly unethical way, abused his professional office, and engaged in conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice. And there we have it, signed, Bennett Gershman. <sighs> How many of you were were like offended by that letter when you when you saw that response that King of the you know the King Kratz wrote that letter to Stephen, and then Stephen you know the response when Stephen said you know why don't you help me with my appeal or whatever and you know when I when we saw all that stuff I mean I remember being just so offended by that. Well, clearly, you know. Mr. Gershman feels the same way. <laughs> so, um, I mean, you can see what he's going through all that stuff and talking about how Avery was in a vulnerable position. You know, I mean, hey, if you guys have seen my video about the Keepers, the, the new Netflix documentary, The Keepers, I did a video after watching that show. And in that video, I talk about how, how very similar Father Malik was. Was it Malik? Anyway, the the priest that was really the one that was in charge of all the the bad stuff that was going on there, and how very similar he was to Kratz in choosing victims that were choosing that you know pe um, 
choosing their victims from people that were already like victims of some kind of violence or victims of something already. And therefore easy, they were easy to push around and easy to, you know, keep quiet and that sort of stuff. So it's, it's, it's really amazing similarity there. And what he's drawing the parallel here is, is that with Avery being in the position where he's in prison and he has no, he doesn't have freedom. He, you know, he's in, you know, when he's really not in a position to, to be able to, bargain or 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 barter with any kind of you know from any kind of position of strength and and kratz knows this and kratz is is exploiting it and he's using he's basically exploiting weakness and and because he's basically saying this is kratz's mo this is who he is he tries to say that it's drugs but no this is who it is this is who he is it comes out in his actions no matter what because these letters that he exchanged with steven were all just at the at the end of 2015 and at the beginning of 2016 okay so that's long after he's already gotten treatment for you know his drug addiction and all that stuff and yet he was still coming after Stephen at that in that way when Stephen was in a position of weakness you know where he's basically stuck in jail in prison and can't do anything really to help himself so that's about it this is very fascinating stuff. I mean, I'm going to go ahead and keep going through this, guys. I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll focus on each one of the different expert witnesses and kind of go through what they're looking to, to prove. And I'll just go through one by one uh, as, we, as we go along. So hope you enjoyed it all. And hey, all you rally people out there, enjoy. And if you haven't already, please hit subscribe.